tell us a little bit about how you how your family uh, came to Detroit because I know you're actually your family's from New Orleans, right? Yes, I was born in Detroit by accident, really, or not not only that, I think by custom. My father uh, was an apprentice to his father, uh, Louis Charbonnet, uh, who was a craftsman, an engineer, a millwright, um, a developer, a uh, man of all trades in New Orleans, well known at the time, honored. And um, dad was one of seven brothers who worked with their father. And one day they were working in the office when a white man walked in off the street. Um, he entered and had a, a, a request of my grandfather, but he addressed him as Louis. It was at a time when no white man was, re was regarded by a black man, except by his surname. All black men were called by their first names. And that was an insult to my father, my proud father, my proud Creole father, who then asked him, interrupted, to say, do you know to whom you're speaking? Harry. <laughs> <laughs> and according to my cousin, who I met a few years ago in New Orleans, that signaled the need for my family to get my father out of New Orleans before sundown. It was then that my father and my pregnant mother, with my older sister, took off for Detroit, Michigan, where his life could be saved. Um, if you've read Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of River Suns, then you know that we were just one of those families who was relocated by custom. Um, I was born four years later in Detroit, and in 1924, the family returned to New Orleans upon the illness of my grandfather. But I, so I don't have any recollection of Detroit um, but that story was lost in my family until just a few years ago when I learned it on a visit to New Orleans. Nice. So when you were in New Orleans, you said you you mentioned you come from a Creole background. Can you explain a little bit about what uh, Creole is? Well, I thought that all Creoles were, were brown people. <laughs> um, Actually, my family came into this country as French people uh, before the Louisiana Purchase uh, in the mid-1700s. Um, two brothers came over from Tiers, France, settling in New Orleans. Um, one of them, brothers, went on to fight in the Haitian Revolution on the wrong side. The other settled in Natchitoches. I'm a descendant of the family who went into Haiti. Upon the death of the, that, that officer, that French officer, who had left a family in Haiti, the son came home to New Orleans, returned to New Orleans, and later, in what I heard, what I read of as being an unhappy marriage, um, took um, an African-American slave as his wife, with whom he produced 11 children. My family was therefore, came out of that group. Um, it was interesting, I was doing my genealogy about 20 years ago, and I kept running into the slave curtain, and it didn't dawn on me that my family even went back further than that. And it wasn't until I was found by a white member of the family, of the Charbonnets, in searching out his family, that he found my family in California, and I realized that, oh, it doesn't stop at the slave curtain. It goes all the way back to the 1700s then, therefore, back to the 1400s. The people who settled in this country 
were called Creoles, just as the Spanish who settled in this country were known as Islenos. My family brings together the Creole and the Islenos uh, in, into New Orleans uh, sequentially. Um, I don't think that I've ever had any, any more of a sophisticated understanding of Creoles than that. Uh -huh. But it was your family, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned California. Uh -huh. you, you were in New Orleans during the Great Flood in 1927, right, on yes. uh, Good Friday. And after that, your family, you know, they had um, lost everything in that flood and moved out to California. Yes, yeah. it was in 1927 when the Great Flood happened in New Orleans, and um, the city fathers chose to bomb the levees to save the Garden District and St. Charles Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, they bombed, they sacrificed the seventh, the sixth, the seventh and ninth wards, and the Treme, which was our ancestral home. And that year, my mother arrived in at Oakland at the 16th Street Southern Pacific Station with three little girls, everything we had left in a couple of cardboard suitcases and a crucifix to join George Allen, who was my grandfather, her father, who had settled out here during the first world, after the First World War. Um, they were sharing a little shotgun bungalow out on the 76th Avenue. My gra grandfather, Papa George Allen, uh, my two Pullman Porter brothers, and a sister, Vivian, um, and uh, Papa's third wife, who was Aunt Louise, and we were no longer required to call them grandmother. She was Aunt Louise. And we would wait for my father, who would join us in a couple of months, and I would be in life as a child of the service worker generation. Our fathers and our uncles were the red caps and the Pullman porters and the waiters and the cooks and the janitors and the bellhops. And our mothers were 50 cents an hour domestic servants, cleaning white people's homes and taking care of white people's children. Mm -hmm. Because that's who we were in those years. Mm -hmm. I graduated from high school, from Castlemont High School, with two opportunities for employment open to me. I could have worked in agriculture, or I could have been a domestic servant. My older sister Marjorie, beautiful young woman and a talented artist, spent the first five years of her marriage as half of a domestic team. Mm. Her young husband was a chauffeur, and Marjorie was a housekeeper for family in Piedmont. Mm. And because I lived in on the premises with Thursdays off, which was traditional, they could save every penny they earned toward the down payment on their first home. And this was the pathway into the middle class mm -hmm. for African Americans right. when were, I was 18. Yeah, and you worked a little bit one day as a domestic. There's a great story in the book I about- I only lasted one day. Or a weekend, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was either that or marry Will, and I married Will. Right, yes, she did. <laughs> Actually, I really did. I married Mel Reed, whose family has made, up, made its way out across the country from Griffin, Georgia, at the first sound of cannon fire of the Civil War. And in 1942, when I married, Mel, his father, and his grandmother had all been born in Berkeley General Hospital on Dwight Way. Um, he was in his senior year at the University of San Francisco, playing left half back for the San Francisco Dons, and what 19-year-old wouldn't prefer that? Right. <laughs> so I, I never did spend my life as a domestic servant. Right, because you were married uh, quite young. I married well. Yeah, you married well <laughs> at 20. Right? Yeah. Yes, quite young. Yeah. So what was, can you give us, a, there's a ton of great stories in the book about your early experience working, because you, when you first married, it took you a, a while to for, conceive a child, and you eventually adopted your first child, Rick. At 23. Right. What? agency would allow a 23-year-old to <laughs> adopt a child. But I was so imprinted with my role uh, of being a wife and mother, and I cannot claim that I wasn't complicit in my capture as a, I wasn't a feminist, because I hadn't delivered a baby by the time I was 23. We adopted one, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was my only child until he was five, um, Rick. Right, right. Yeah. And um, so I was wondering if you could tell a little story about one of your first experiences working either in San Francisco, uh, and I think it was the San Francisco Civil Service Union, or 
um, maybe yeah. at the segregated union hall in Richmond. There's tons of great stories in the book. Yeah, so I, I my first job, I think, pretty much was during during the uh, Second World War as a, a clerk in the basement of the Federal Building on McAllister. Um, I was working, but I, I, I didn't know which federal agency, I don't really remember which federal agency it was. I just know that we went every day and we met at tables, long tables, with long boxes of file cards into which the bar and flag cards were filed against the um, cards that uh, were processed when people took civil service examinations. There were pink, blue, pink and blue cards. The blue cards were the, were the flag files, and the pink cards were the bar cards. So the, if you were filing cards and you found um, a, your card was blue and it met one of the results of a civil service examination, um, it would have a warning on it. This, this uh, person, uh, car was seen parked within two blocks of a communist cell in Vallejo or something of that sort. So that means that they would have to have further investigation before they could be hired. If that card was pink, it meant under no circumstances was that person to be hired because that was a bar card. Uh, they were probably uh, suspected at higher risk than that. Um, that was the first job I had. Um, I was, it was at a time when San Francisco was subject to having air raid sirens go off, um, suspected um, submarines off the coast or, or an unidentified plane in the area, because of course we were at war. Mm -hmm. My parents became concerned that I would be caught in San Francisco uh, during an air raid, uh, and so I transferred to the civil service, to the Air Force, uh, as a federal employee, uh, at the Air Force had taken over the the uh, Leamington Hotel in Oakland. So as a transfer, I didn't realize that I was in over my head that you could not work in the clerical departments for the Air Force unless you were white. And I didn't realize that. And because I'm racially ambiguous, no one had picked it up. So I found myself just a few days later um, with the young woman whose desk abutted mine uh, being called up by the lieutenant in charge of the section to be warned that I was colored and that she was getting very, very close to me and she should know that. Um, I watched the conversation from afar and it was very clear that my young friend, who I'd been sharing lunches with, um, was upset about something. Her face was reddened. Um, she came back to her desk, and I said, what was that? Because they had been looking at me while they were talking. And I said, was it something about me? And she admitted that, though she couldn't make on cont eye contact with me, she admitted that the lieutenant had warned her that I was colored and that she should know. Um, I got up and immediately walked to the front of the, to his desk and said, who told you that I was not? And he said, <laughs> he said, don't worry, Betty. We, we, I've talked with, with all the, the people who work with you and your supervisors and, and they're willing to work with you. <laughs> and I said, but are they willing to work under me? Mm -hmm. When my when my uh, upgrade comes, <laughs> yeah, I went back to my desk because he said, um, "You, we, we will see that you get your pay raises," which meant no. And so I went back to my desk, picked up my purse, walked out on the Air Force, and never want to look back. Yay, Betty, <laughs> Miss Betty. Maybe that was my. Second political act. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> then there's tons more to come in the yeah. book, huh? Um, so, you, uh, after, so you were starting your new family, yeah. and um, your husband, Mel, at the time was, you know, I, I think he was trying to get into the Navy, or went into the Navy, and there, he had... was actually at Great Lakes when I was doing the thing with the Air Force. Mel 
being a quarter, being a half, left halfback for the San Francisco Dons, when war was declared, went to the recruitment office, as any red-blooded football player would do, and volunteered to fight for his country, and found himself at Great Lakes in the Messman's Corps. Mel, who was a third-generation Californian, the two of us had, who had grown up as second-generation Californians, um, simply had never had any experience with that kind of thing. Um, he refused, and at his refusal, they got him before a board of examiners to try to shake him down. Um, he was not to be not to be dissuaded from his position. They kept him for three days, gave him mustering out pay, an honorable discharge, sent him home, told him to forget that it ever happened, but that they could not afford to put a natural leader of men mm -hmm. in onto a ship where men who might be easily led because it would spell mutiny at sea. Mm -hmm. He went to his grave, not ever telling that story, feeling that he'd failed his country. Um, I felt that his country failed him. Right. Um, that was when I, when he came back to Berkeley uh, at, after that experience to find me having just left the Air Force for the same reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were not very good. We were not very obedient. <laughs> right. And that's how you guys decided to start your own business. We were not going to ever work for white folks again. Right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we came back and established Reed's Records in, in, right. our, in the basement, in our garage. <laughs> And it's still in existence. And it's still in existence seven right. years later. Yeah, and your son David Reed, actually I should mention, is selling books today, and so be sure to get your book afterwards. Um, so yeah, so at around that time you uh, decided to build a house in Walnut Creek. Yes. yes, Mel was playing professional football. His teammates were all moving out to the suburbs. Mel, as parents, had moved to Danville, had a little truck farm out there. Uh, kept, they kept a couple of horses. We would take the kids from Berkeley uh, out to, to ride the horses on Sunday afternoons and would pass through Saranap, which was between Lafayette and Walnut Creek. Mel fell in love with a, a lot that was there, decided this was where he's going to establish a home for his family. And we got, we knew that we couldn't buy the property because they were, this was all white. This the Diablo Valley had only one African-American couple, Jack and Eleanor Watkins, and their twins. Um, we got Lionel Wilson's wife, who was white, Dorothy Wilson. Lionel, who was at that time, I think, mayor of Oakland, or judge of Oakland, whatever it was. Um, she made the purchase. We got a Quaker uh, architect to design our home, built a house, a lovely redwood house out in Diablo Valley, and then lived with five years of death threats. Um, it was an incredible period. But the acceleration of social change that was accelerated by what happened here in San Francisco Bay Area was so strong that that same community, 20 years later, sent me to, rec rec to, to represent them as a McGovern delegate to the Miami Democratic Convention. So it was not without its benefits. Right. So that was a pretty hard time for you back then. You're, um, you had your adopted son, Rick, and then you, uh, your son, Bob, and David, and then you had also um, had a daughter who was developmentally disabled, and your husband, Mel, was working a lot. So that was, I think you called this chapter Into the Lion's Den. Could you describe a little bit about, I mean, you, I think you, you talk about having a breakdown back then. And can you talk a little bit about how you overcame that? That's a difficult period, but also it was a period of growth that I don't think has been matched by any other period in my life. Um, I could not find my voice while I was a victim in those first five years. But I found it 
when the opportunity to become a defender of someone else arose. There was a young couple who had, he was a truck driver and she was a nurse's aide, as I remember, I don't remember their names, young African-American couple who had bought into a, a low-income community in Pleasant Hill, uh, moderate price homes, uh, and the Improvement Association gathered to prevent their moving in. And I read about their plight in an announcement for the Improvement Association meeting in the local paper and decided that I was going to go and to their Improvement Association meeting because I had lived through that. And my neighbors by that time had lived through it with me and that we had come to a different place. And I thought if I can go there to their Improvement Association meeting and share that, tell them that this, go, this passes, that they will get over it. Um, and, and, and maybe I can keep this young couple from suffering from the same fate that we had. Um, a young attorney, David Borton, who lived in the area, saw a letter that I'd written to the editor of that newspaper and called me, looked me up, and said that he didn't think that I was going, uh, that I should go to that meeting that I was going to be hurt. And I said, no, I'm not, because they don't say those ugly things when, when in your presence they only say them behind your back. And I will go and I will sit in the audience and I will get up when it's appropriate and I will make my speech and then I will somehow save the situation for everybody. He said, they will hurt you. And I said, no. I will go. He said, then I will also be there. But I had never met him. He was an attorney. He was a member of the Unitarian Church, Fellowship actually that time. It was not a church yet. Um, he said, there will also be friends there. And I did. I drove out, drove out to that little, it was an elementary school cafeteria where they were meeting, walked in the lion's den, sat on the aisle seat, waited for my turn, assuming that they were going to recognize me and that I was going to be able to have my speech, you know, while they were getting over it. And they didn't recognize me because I'm racially ambiguous. Though I was less than two miles away, known as that nigger family on the corner of Warren Road and Boulevard Way, here in Gregory Gardens, I was not recognized. And I got to hear all the awful things that people say at those meetings without anybody knowing I was among them. And it was at a point where I couldn't stand it any longer when a woman got up and said, if we can't get rid of the undesirable niggers in any other way, we can use the health department on the basis of the healthy diseases, the, the, the unhealthy diseases they bring in. Mm. At which point I got up and walked to the front of the auditorium and said, I can no longer eavesdrop. I am Betty Reed, and I am here, and I made my speech and told them up, and I, in the middle of it, my mouth went dry, and I was terrified. And I ran out of the auditorium to my car. By this time, it was in the dark, because we'd gone in in the daylight, and now it's dark. And I heard thundering footsteps behind me, and I thought I was being chased. I got into the car and someone appeared at the car window as I was trying to unlock the car. It was a reporter. He said, I, I need to know your name. I'll call you when, 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 when I get out here, but I have to go back in and hear what happens as the result of, of what you've just done. And then the next hand on my shoulder was David Borton saying, I'm here, I'm David. And that was when I joined the Unitarian denomination forever. <laughs> <laughs> but that Improvement Association never met again. Though the couple did not remain, their lives were made miserable. Mm -hmm. So I think you mentioned that this is when you started to see that your power was internal, that you could, yeah. you know, that... This is when, that was the point where I became self-defined. Mm -hmm. I think that up to that point, I'd been defined pretty much by the men in my life. I realized that I could 
I could do this. I could do this without, I don't think I ever even shared the story with Mel. It was something that I needed to do for myself, mm -hmm. not only for that couple, but for me. And I think I was successful, um, though I felt shamed at the time because I'd bolted, but I'd done what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. This was also the time you started um, writing songs, right? When, when I went into a period where I was struggling with being a lone, lonely wife mm -hmm. in the suburbs among many lonely women whose husbands were all in the cities, in the urban areas, making the mortgage money. Um, I was raising th three little boys, a handicapped daughter, I had to find ways to travel with Dory hanging to my skirt because I couldn't leave her, even for moments. Um, I was learning to live with all of that in a hostile community and became fairly suicidal. Mm. I had to find deep within me the strength to travel without leaving myself behind. And I found within me the little girl who sang in the St. Vincent Millay's Renaissance behind the barn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I began to write music uh, for about 10 years. I was secretly performing composing, uh, never wanting to be a singer, but needing to be Betty who sings. Mm -hmm. um, I would sing in my church. I would sing at, at college campuses with other poets. I find that over time I documented about 20 years of history I could sing for an hour all original music, but never published anything. Mm. Um, that music was all preserved on tapes, which have recently been digitized. Mm -hmm. And now I am hearing them in the third person. I can play on my cell phone songs in the voice of Betty of 40 years ago. <laughs> and I find myself competing with my younger self. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're actually the... She wins. She wins. <laughs> no, she doesn't. I like this better. <laughs> Kerr and Betty sound more like Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> So, like the text for a lot of your songs is, are actually in the book, and they're very poetic. Yes. Um, and the the title of the book is actually a, another song that you wrote, and um, "Sign My Name to Freedom" is another one of your songs. I'd, I'd love you to be able, you know, read it. Maybe yes, tell I maybe tell a story about which one is. Oh yeah, this is the one. The title is "Sign My Name to Freedom." And the story is that Susan Sanford, I think she was 18, the young daughter of Don Sanford, who was a member of my church, who was going off to Canton, Mississippi in summer of 64 to work in a freedom school with SNCC. From her letters home, some couple of them that Don shared with many of us, allowed me to imagine the woman in whose house, whose home, Susan may have shared with other snake workers or with the woman's family. And I wrote this song at that time. It's Monday morning, streets are bare. Seems like they don't want me nowhere since I went to the courthouse and signed my name to freedom. 
Daughters say, mustn't run. Sound of trumpets, the kingdoms come. Mama, go to the courthouse. Got to sign your name to freedom. Fields of fire, cotton flaming neath the summer skies. Shrouds of white, no name naming. You don't know this dream can't die. Churches burned, deacon dead. Still I know it's like daughter said. Ain't no turning back now. I done signed my name to freedom. Young folks here around my table talking through the night. Faces here I can't label. Brown ones blending with the white. Sunday morning, church ain't there. Bombed it Wednesday, but I can't care. God was down at the courthouse. Day I signed my name to freedom. My Lord was down at the courthouse. Day I signed my name. And Susan Sanford is in the house right now. She came, Sam Susan. <laughs> Susan and I reconnected tonight for the first time since 1964. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for reading that song. It's so beautiful. I, um, we're sort of running out of time, so I mean, there's so much more we could talk about, but I'm sure people in the audience have questions, um, and maybe we'll open it up for about... 50, 10, 15 minutes of questions now. If anybody has questions, we have a mic as well. Okay. I want to uh, hear about how you became a park ranger. <laughs> <laughs> I backed in the park ranger business. Um, I came in uh, some years ago, I guess 15 years ago now, as a field representative. That was when I returned to the Bay Area from the suburbs after my kids grew up, after raising four kids to adulthood and outliving two husbands. Um, I came back into, Rich into Richmond as a field representative for a member of the California State Assembly. I worked for Dion Ariner, and when Dion term limited out, I stayed on as a field representative for her successor. Lonnie Hancock, who only recently term limited out of the California State Senate. I was in Richmond in a one-person satellite office doing constituency work and helping to determine what kind of legislation might be needed out of the five cities of West Contra Costa County over which my office sat. And if you're wondering whether I became a genius with the time I was 20 and 15 years ago, may I quickly assure you that that's anything but true, that that amount of social change that occurred in this nation over those intervening years is just amazing. It was in that year when I came back into Richmond as a field rep that the park was being formed in my assembly district. And I began to attend meetings of the planning groups who were here from Washington, from the National Park Service, from the Department of Interior, to determine the shape of this park. And because it was very clear to me that the city of Richmond had been selected as the only place in the country suitable for interpreting the home front story because there were more still standing structures through which to, to, to interpret that history than any other place in the country where they'd all been redeveloped out of existence. But all of the the structures that would have told my story as an African American had been turned out turned torn down immediately when the war ended. So if this story was to be inclusive, it had to incorporate those stories, not only of Rosie the Riveter, who was a white woman's story. The women in my family had been working outside their homes in slavery. It had always taken two two salaries to mm -hmm. support black families because very few men at the service level could do it on their own. 
So our mothers and our aunts had been working outside their homes since slavery. So this was not going to tell our story, nor was it going to tell the story of the 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans who were interned, 120,000, 70,000 of whom were American citizens, nor the braceros who were brought in from Mexico to take over the agricultural scenes when the Japanese were interned. There were so many stories, and if that park was going to be inclusive of its total history, there had to be a broader approach. That was when I became involved as a consultant to the National Park Service, because fear that that history was going to be distorted was not going to be inclusive. And four years later, after a four-year contract as a consultant, I became a park ranger at the age of 85 because you guys have forgotten all that good stuff. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, the mic's coming. He's coming, he's coming. Thank you, Betty. Uh, tell me your, your read records which should, is, should be a landmark in the Bay Area. Uh, when did you start that? I remember when I was a youngster, if I wanted tickets to go to any concert of gospel, <laughs> yes. Betty, it was Reed Records. That's right. That's the only place. And I remember when I gave many concerts, I had my tickets at Reed Records at Swan's Department Store. <laughs> when did you organize? When was that uh, June organized? June 1st of 1945. Night. We opened this. We we cut a, a hole in the, in the garage window of the wall, and we had we had the albums uh, in in orange crates, and the the uh, a cigar box for the money, and um, the safe was our, our our washing machine in the back of the store. <laughs> <laughs> it was an. Inauspicious beginning, but we but we got we, we we did it, we did it because we were we were going to be independent and we were, right. Yeah. That was on Sacramento Street. Right? Uh, on Sacramento Street at thirty one oh one Sacramento Street. Nice. Emmett Powell, how are you, Emmett? I can't see you. <laughs> I thought I recognized your voice. <laughs> it's a question over there. Yes. Um, my name is Kayla Barnes. Thank you so much for being with us uh, tonight. My question is, you've lived and seen so much, um, a lot of good times in our country, a lot of not so great times. What gives you hope? What gives me hope is the fact that I think that I have, at 96, I have lost my sense of future. Um, I don't any longer have a peer group. Um, I am at the place where there are no more models for me. Um, but in compensation, um, I have an enhanced sense of past. And that I know, in looking back, that these periods of chaos are cyclical, that they've been going on since 1776, that in those periods are the times when when the democracy is being redefined, that we can get at the reset buttons, that those are the times. That, and we're, we're in one of them now, incidentally. Those are the times when the table's being set for the next generation. And I'm seeing that we're, on, we're, we're, that we're all involved in an upward, upward, upward spiral, that we keep touching the same places at higher and higher levels. And we're in one of them again now. Um, all of those things which have been encoded and hidden are now obvious and out there for us to see and get at. I have great hope. I have sat in the last month with incredible young women at the Makers Conference in Southern California. Unbelievable young women motivated beyond anything that I've ever seen in my life. Only this last weekend, 
I was a member of, of a presenter at Bend, Oregon, with another muse of the world. Young women from all over the world, and, and there is such hope. There is such energy. They're, they're so motivated. Um, I can't help but I just wish I could make a, you know, a Faustian bar bargain for another 20 years. Right, yeah. <laughs> we hope that as well. <laughs> they're going to take me away kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a question at the back. A couple of questions at the back. Hi, my name is Joy. Um, thanks for having this and being here. I, I didn't get here on time, sorry. I work in the South Bay. Um, but my question was, where did your family move to California from? How far back did they go? Did they migrate from the South, like me? Or where are you all from, if I can ask, sorry. We still call New Orleans home. That, that's, the, that's where my family comes from. That's where our culture comes from. That's where I identify most clearly. Um, though I grew up from the age of six in California, um, my roots are still buried in New Orleans. I'm a Charbonnet. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. And that means a lot to me still. Hi, I just want to say, you're fantastic. I hope I look like yeah. that when I'm 96. <laughs> you're fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd just like to tell you, my family's from New Orleans, too. And when we did our DNA, come to find out our last name is Bro, B-R-U. But we had been Johnsons for a long time until they changed it. <laughs> but anyway, but I just want to tell you, you did a good job, and it's been a hard time, but you look good for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's one question over there in the back. Oh, one, one question in the back right there. And then we'll have to... Hi, Betty. Um, again, thank you so much for coming. I just wanted to ask, since you said you were a former field representative, as I am currently, I wanted to ask you, if, have you ever at any point in your career thought about running for office? <laughs> no. You know what? <laughs> no, I, clearly. This, this um, is a story I think that we ought to close with. But, mm -hmm. but my great-grandmother, Leontine Bro Allen, was born into slavery in 1846. And she was enslaved until she was 19, freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. Which time she married George Allen, who was a member of the, the uh, Louisiana State Colored Troops fighting on the side of the Civil War. She lived to be 102, not dying until 1948, three years after my experience in that Jim Crow Union Hall. Her role in her village, in St. James Parish, was that she was the intern to Dr. Heidel, who would come through on, his, on horseback about every three months. And her job was to go through the village hanging a white towel on the gates, on the fence posts of where he was to be visiting. When he had finished his rounds, he would meet with her. And they'd talk about the aftercare for those patients. And it wasn't until I was in Washington receiving an award from the women's, the National Women's History Project and got to visit in Anacostia an exhibit of the midwives of that year of, of slavery and saw the equivalent of my great-grandmother there. And the next night, I, that night, I was to be awarded this, given this award at the Hay, the Hay House Hotel. Um, I remember coming to terms with the fact that I had spent my entire life based on the stories that my Papa George, my grandfather, told me about his mother, about that story in particular, that I had been hanging imaginary white towels on imaginary gateposts ever since I was a kid that I had never, never aspired to being that top person. I always cast myself in that role of being the supporter. I made a lifetime of it, and I'm still doing that, even in the National Park Service. And that is, I think, realizing or bringing into being her life that was lost to slavery. 
I carry her picture around in my wallet every day of my life. She was in my breast pocket when I met the President of the United States, the first African-American president. She was with me. Um, no, I've never wanted a public office <laughs> because what I had was a whole lot worse, better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Miss Betty. This we just touched on, like you know, a little bit of all the stories that are in your book. And <laughs> thank you. Like I said, they're going to be in the back if you want to get your copy, and we'll be doing some signings as well. Um, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you.